Once upon a time, there was a mercenary named Taro Sakamoto, a man who knew no equal because he was extremely strong. 2. Everyone who was a member of the bandit gang was afraid when Sakamoto appeared on the horizon. Their hands began to shake just from his murderous gaze. He could have easily cut off his head, and those who threatened his life did not make much effort. He was truly unsurpassed. His techniques impressed everyone who came face to face with him, and after that they lost all desire to meet him at least once more. All the people who worked as mercenary killers treated him with great respect. They wanted to adopt all his skills for themselves, and all the local robbers were scared to death of him. But one day everything changed. Everything was as usual. In the evening, Sakamoto once again went to a local store to buy some groceries, and the girl who worked there greeted him with a slight smile. And this was the reason for all the changes in the future. Taro Sakamoto fell head over heels in love with her. As soon as his eyes fell on the dark-haired girl, he stared at her with his mouth open, crazy about her beauty. Later on, the man resigned, forgetting about the business he had been passionate about for so many years, and after a while, the young couple decided to get married and legalize their relationship. After a certain period of time, he and his wife had a baby, whom they loved very much from the moment he was born. Once upon a time, there was a mercenary named Taro Sakamoto, a man who knew no equal because he was extremely strong. They lived in a happy and close-knit family, supporting each other in difficult situations. And later, when the boy arrived in the Japanese capital specifically to meet with Master Sakamoto, he found the famous Sakamoto's shop and was going to visit it. At the time, a little boy was standing there, calling out to Mr. Taro to show him something, and the older man looked carefully in the direction the boy was pointing. The boy asked the man if he could take a free juice can if he hit the target with a suction cup arrow, and then the boy showed him where he should shoot. Sakamoto told his wife, as she came closer to her husband, that this little boy had been visiting them often in recent weeks, and that the child had missed the target. The boy shouted something and was about to try a second time and was sure that this time he would hit the right spot, calling out to Sakamoto. But when he bent down to pick up the arrow, his backpack opened. The books, along with the entire contents of the briefcase, fell on the white pants of one of the shop's customers. The boy looked up at him, stepping back awkwardly, and the older man meanwhile took hold of his T-shirt and threw a tantrum over his damaged clothes. The wife noticed that the man wanted to beat the child and then asked Sakamoto what to do now because the man began to threaten the child with death. The very next moment, Taro approached the client, stopping his hand from almost hitting the boy, and after he stood there in shock, Sakamoto took out a pen. He grabbed the impudent man by the hair, putting the object right up to his chin, thus protecting the guy. In a matter of minutes, a dissatisfied customer with a frown was leaving the store, cursing the sellers, and the child thanked the nail technician for his help. It would have taken a little more, and Sakamoto could have killed this customer, as he had done with his enemies before. But he was just lucky, and after a short while they heard the voice of a guy who came into the store. The guy claimed that he clearly saw the man pierce his carotid artery with a regular pen. The mercenary seer Shin was also closely involved in this case, and he introduced himself afterwards, glaring at Sakamoto a little angrily. But the very next moment, the former mercenary hit Shin hard in the face. The guy immediately jumped away from him, surprised when he started hitting him. They had once worked together on a task. And it turned out that Shin could read minds, but soon everything calmed down and they talked calmly to each other. Shin was very sorry that the community had resigned and begged him to return to the criminal world, as his excellent skills were being wasted and his body weight was only increasing but he firmly replied that he would not return to his previous life, despite the fact that the guy persistently tried to convince him otherwise and remind him that all criminals were afraid of him. When Sakamoto refused once again, Shin banged his fists on the table and started shouting, saying that he was a legend and could not just forget about his past. The man was quietly chewing his noodles, looking at Shin, and the latter could not stand it any longer and took out a cigarette to smoke. Shin started muttering something under his breath, but something surprised him, and then the cigarette fell out of his mouth. While Sakamoto was eating quietly, Shin noticed a sign announcing that smoking was prohibited. Shin sat in shock. Despite the fact that Sakamoto had already lost his form, he could still kill him with such speed that the guy wouldn't even have time to blink. 
the very next moment, the man was called by a friend of his who was passing by the shop on a bicycle and asked him to help him, and Shin was surprised when Sakamoto was asked to help. A man needed to trim the branches in his garden, but he couldn't get there, but Taro assured him that he would help him. And the next moment, his wife came up to him, saying that their little girl didn't want to eat vegetables at all, and then the boys came and wanted to play with the ball, but they only had one. Everyone wanted Taro to help them. Shin watched in shock, and then thought that he was skillfully hiding his true nature. Shin called his current nature a laughingstock, to which he simply did not respond. The boy decided that it was time to go and said goodbye, after which he assured him that they would meet again someday. But when Shin turned to leave, an arrow thrown by the little boy hit his head. The man cursed unhappily, but later he was already sitting in his car. More than five years had passed since he last saw Sakamoto, and the man had grown very fat. But the man was still very cool despite all this. He hadn't lost all his skills. If you ignore Taro's excess weight, his aura remains as irresistible as ever, and Shin was eager to work with the man again. As soon as he left, he received a call from his boss, who asked him hopefully if he had managed to convince Sakamoto to return to his old job, but Shin a little sadly replied that he had not. The guy asked again if he was sure he needed to get rid of the man. Sakamoto is already covered in fat. He is absolutely no threat to them now. But the boss was of a different opinion. According to all the laws of the organization, when you leave it, you are eliminated. Sakamoto betrayed them, and they could not allow the man to remain alive. In addition to all this, there were already dozens of people behind the boss's back who claimed Taro's head, and if Shin continued to talk, the same people would go after his life. The boss ordered Taro to be killed immediately. There was no choice, as sooner or later he would be settled so Shin decided that in that case, he would do it himself. The boy went to the store again, seriously determined, and was met in the yard by his wife, who was standing next to the boy, who immediately asked if he could play with him, but the boy refused. It was not the right time for that. Shin took out his weapon and entered the store while Sakamoto was calmly reading a newspaper. The man said with a disgruntled face that he had to leave the city as soon as possible, so Shin pulled out his gun and walked even closer to the man. Shin then pointed a gun directly at Taro and opened fire in the store. The bullet flew past the old master, who looked at Shin in shock but did not let go of the newspaper. And then Sakamoto deflected the bullet with a regular cough pill, which surprised Shin, and then ice cream flew right into the guy's face. Shin ducked, looking around for Sakamoto, who had disappeared. Shin could neither find him nor read the man's thoughts, although he had done it before with flying colors, and Sakamoto had already run to the warehouse and hid there, picking up a rubber band to attack the boy with when he found him. Sakamoto watched through the net to see if Shin was coming toward him. And the very next moment, the man launched this thought right at him, which scared the guys and almost got him caught. Shin ran as fast as he could, throwing everything off the store shelves along the way, and then went around the corner of the store and fired a shot at the man, but he easily dodged it. The next second, a strange sticky thing flew at Shin, but with such force that it knocked him down, and all his hair was covered in this sweet candy. While Shin stood confused in the middle of the store, Sakamoto was already there, standing behind him, and he realized that it would be worth changing his location, but he didn't have time to do anything. Sakamoto kicked Shin with all the strength he had, and the young man flew to the opposite side of the store with a loud scream, knocking over all the food on his way. He fell to the ground and hit himself hard, after which he lost consciousness and woke up on the bed with a compress on his forehead and his body bandaged. Next to Shin stood Sakamoto's wife and their little daughter, who happily exclaimed that the boy had finally woken up. He shook his head, not understanding where he was, but they reassured him that they were all on the second floor of the store. They kindly brought him a bunch of dishes for lunch, and Shin was surprised when they put so much rice in front of him. He realized that he had not fulfilled his task, but Sakamoto suggested that he start eating, and Shin began to eat, but thought that the food might be poisonous and that it would take a long time to remove the poison. But it was so warm and tasty that he couldn't stop and kept eating everything that was put there. He looked exactly the same as when they first met, the girl exclaimed joyfully, and Shin was haunted by a strange feeling. He had never felt like this in all his time as a mercenary. 
Did Taro resign just to save his boring life? It's so stupid. But Shin ate anyway, and then thanked them for such hospitality, and Sakamoto began to write something on a piece of paper. Taro invited the boy to come to the shop in the future, and Shin smiled slightly and realized that he was still far from Sakamoto's skill. When the young man returned to his organization, he was immediately approached by his boss, who demanded to know if he had anything to tell him about his failed assignment. This was a great shame in the boss's mind, because Shin failed to eliminate Sakamoto and fulfill this important assignment. The next moment, the guy fell to his knees, bowing his head to his boss and begging him to let Mr. Sakamoto live on, but to the head of the organization, it sounded like a mockery. The man could not understand why he was defending Taro, who had betrayed the organization. But the young man continued to stand his ground. Sakamoto had a family of his own, but this did not convince the boss at all, because he had broken the rules, he had abandoned his duties, and it was because of this that he should die. Then the guy decisively pulled out a gun and put it to his neck, saying that if anyone refused to do his duty, it would be him, after which he asked once again that the man be allowed to live on. The boss asked Shin what he was doing and why he was doing it, to which he replied that it was his punishment for pointing a gun at his hero. For a while, the boss was silent, not even knowing what to say, but after a few seconds, he said that he should do as he pleased, let him kill himself, and then he could safely deal with Sakamoto. The boss of the organization had many thoughts going through his mind. He thought Shin was a fool for believing and admiring a man like Sakamoto and for going to kill himself for this man. But no one took into account the fact that Shin is a seer, so the guy was not surprised by this, and then he pointed his gun at the boss and was about to shoot. The boss had completely forgotten that the guy could read minds, and then finally became convinced that he had to be killed, and Shin realized that he now had no other choice. Meanwhile, Sakamoto's shop was sad. There were absolutely no people in the store, and the man sat with a gloomy face listening to music. Soon he decided to open a cash register and then began typing something on the keyboard. And after a while, the man entered a room where a great variety of weapons were stored. He looked at the riches that were stored in his seemingly ordinary shop. He walked over to a shelf where there were pistols with grenades, and Sakamoto picked up one of them. Meanwhile, Shin was trying to hide from people who were in the same organization as him, but now became his sworn enemies. He was fighting against one person, but it seemed as if the guy was predicting their every move. Sheen's pistol was almost out of bullets, but he was not going to give up. Sheen was a seer, and if you get too close to him, he can easily read all the thoughts in that person's head. The guy realized that there was no other option but to run, even though the guards were going to shoot him by surprise, but he killed his enemies himself. He ran forward as fast as he could, trying not to waste bullets, and for a long time he was skillfully dodging, but one bullet hit him right in the knee. After that, several armed men approached him, pointing their guns directly at him, and Shin realized that he had already stepped into his own grave with one foot. But to his great surprise, the next second he saw Mr. Sakamoto holding a weapon and easily dealing with all the enemies, all of whom fell to the ground from his bullets, and the young man looked at the man in amazement. The boss called out to the guards when he saw Sakamoto and ordered the man to be killed immediately. One of the organization's members approached Sakamoto, but the guy was very scared, and when he tried to shoot the man, Taro started waving his hands. The very next moment, when the guy did release the ammunition, Sakamoto punched him hard in the face. So it hit him hard, and he fell to the floor unconscious. Several other guards approached the man, one of them had a knife, but the attempt to cut the former mercenary failed, as he abruptly grabbed his arm, and then dislocated it, and the knife fell to the floor. The boss shouted that no one should attack him alone because nothing good would come of it. They had to shoot at Taro all at once. But the man seemed to be afraid of absolutely no one and nothing. He decided to defend himself with two knives that he grabbed in his hands and stood on alert for a new attack. And when they decided to turn around, he immediately attacked them, swinging both knives in different directions, wounding everyone who stood near him, including the boss. And Shin watched silently admiring Sakamoto. Despite the fact that the man had lost his figure, he was still a legendary mercenary, feared and admired by all. After the battle, Shin looked up at the man, asking how he knew where he was, 
but Sakamoto silently handed him his weapon without answering. At the same time, the man gave him a microphone. Yesterday, while he was lying unconscious, he put the microphone under the guy's arm. Now Shin had made his choice. He smiled slightly and then saw Sakamoto's apron on the ground. Taro offered the young man to work for him for either yen an hour or 850 yen, and at first Shin was surprised, but he had no choice. Soon he was back in the shop of the man he admired so much, though he didn't look very happy, and the little boy was chasing the ball around the store. After some time had passed, Sakamoto decided to have a snack and picked up his favorite noodles again. But Shin, who was standing next to him, asked him not to eat the noodles next to him, because he was wearing a new shirt and didn't want it to get dirty. Soon after, Taro's wife came up to them and told them that they were running out of ramen, and then turned her attention to the boy and said that he looked great, and the young man, in turn, was embarrassed. An old lady came into the store. She couldn't find the detergent because she couldn't see very well, but Shin came up to her and showed her where the thing she needed was, and she was very surprised because she didn't even say what she needed, and the guy told her everything so quickly. Taro's daughter was delighted with his abilities, and it was really convenient. The very next moment, a little boy came up and mentally said to himself that Mr. Sakamoto looked much better in an apron. But this really annoyed Shin, who could read minds. After that, the boy asked if he was comfortable working here, and he said that he was comfortable even when he didn't know what to do, and in any case, it was better than his previous job. After that, the kid asked where he used to work, and Shin knew he couldn't reveal his real job, so he mumbled that he worked somewhere in a community cleaning organization. And now he moved to Sakamoto's shop, and he actually liked it. It's been a week since Shin gave up his life of crime and went to work for Master Sakamoto, yet he even gave him time off on other days. The man had never seen such a great hand-to-hand -hand fight. Even in retirement, he was better than anyone he knew, but the man just told him to do his job well and talk less. But he paid no attention to it and happily muttered that he had helped eliminate all his enemies at once. When his wife, who was standing next to them, heard this, Aoi angrily asked him why he had returned to killing again, since they had already agreed that Taro would give it up. The man started shaking his head and panicked, not even knowing what to say. But Shin continued to tell him how Taro had quickly dealt with the opponents, and the man said that there were no fatal injuries. The very next moment, without letting her husband talk her out of it, she revealed that the punishment for violating family rules would be divorce. Aoi snorted and walked out of the store with a disgruntled face, and Shin asked what kind of strange family rules were these, while Sakamoto watched his wife. The guy watched this strange situation in amazement, and while he was sweeping the yard, he noticed an officer patrolling the area. He replied that they'd had a lot of robberies lately, so they had to patrol more often, but Sakamoto's was considered the safest store in Japan, so the cop exhaled. However, you never know when criminals will be at it again. You need to be on your guard. But Shin couldn't even imagine any crime being committed here. But his thoughts were interrupted by Taro, who was standing with a box that needed to be delivered to a customer. Meanwhile, bandits climbed onto a local bus, wearing masks and carrying guns, and ordered everyone on board to stay still, because now the bus belonged to them. If the passengers move, they will die in an instant. Sakamoto's wife was on the same bus. She couldn't even imagine what to do now. She had bought ice cream that could melt. She wondered if the gangsters would get angry if she decided to eat it now. And Taro left a notice on the door of the store that he was not there at the moment and was delivering an order. And together with Shin, they went to fulfill the order, at which time the boy decided to ask what family rules his wife was talking about. But there was too little time to explain all these nuances. But the young man suggested that he just remember it because he could read minds, and that was quite enough. He was even a little jealous of this family atmosphere, and while the guy was flying in his thoughts, Taro noticed a bus standing nearby. Sheen braked sharply to avoid hitting him, and the parcel they were supposed to deliver flew out of the cart, all the food in the box scattered on the road. He asked him, breathing heavily, what had happened and was told that one bus had been seized, and that Aoi and his wife were also on it. Meanwhile, the bandits continued to threaten the passengers, because they knew how sad it was to close their favorite manga, and they were going to crash the damn bus into Shue's house. 
and the lives of passengers were to be sacrificed for the sake of a better manga industry. But Aoi didn't care at all. She was only thinking about being late for dinner as she looked out the window. One of the bandits noticed her and said that she looked like she didn't care about the mango. She was terribly calm for someone who was about to die. She only just noticed them. She just smiled and said that she knew Sakamoto would always save her in any situation. The perpetrator asked in surprise who he was, as if the girl was going crazy with fear. But his partner said to forget about this girl because she would die soon anyway, like everyone else here. Meanwhile, Sakamoto ordered the guy to go ahead. They had only two priorities for this rescue mission. The first was to rescue the hostages, and the second was to remain incognito and not show that they were mercenaries. There were to be no killings. Taro added a third priority. Shin had wondered about this in their last competition and didn't understand why the man was so worried about killing, but Taro was silent for a moment. Five years ago, when he was only 22, when his relationship with AoE was just beginning, he was covered in blood again after another mission, and the girl was not at all satisfied with this and was against it. She didn't attack him and didn't understand how he could do such terrible things so easily, but he said that he had to work somewhere and give his beloved gifts. But she didn't want gifts that were washed with someone else's blood, and only after that did the man think about it. The girl immediately went as far away from him as possible, because if he could not change, she could not be with him. And then they just jumped off the bridge. Sakamoto was horrified, and a few seconds later, a powerful explosion was heard. He jumped after her and grabbed her as hard as he could, and the girl's shoes flew off. Soon they landed on the ground. It was very strange that they had survived. Aoi was sure of the opposite, but it was very good that it was still snowing. Sakamoto wanted to say something then, but she cut him off, saying that the only condition for them to be together was that he would not kill her. If instead of killing people he started helping them, it would be much better. That's why they opened the shop. And now the girl was thinking how cute it was when he was so reckless for her. Shin reviewed all his memories, realizing that really killing now would be an unnecessary input, and they would communicate as usual by telepathy. And after discussing the whole plan, they shit on the bus. Once on the roof of the bus, they turned off the engine of their vehicle, and the bandits looked up in shock. Shin ordered Taro to hide his face to remain anonymous in the case. But what destroyed them was the fact that they were approaching the bridge. The bus would have easily passed under it, but they would have definitely been knocked off its roof. Sakamoto jumped up correctly. Jumping across the bridge, the boy meanwhile lay down, hoping that nothing would hit him, but he rolled loudly. When the bus finally passed under the bridge, he started calling out to Sakamoto and looking for him. Sakamoto, who was flying over the rooftops, ordered the bus to point in the right direction. The man noticed the children playing in the streets below. They opened their mouths in surprise. He looked very cool in their eyes. Without wasting any time, Shin climbed inside the bus, breaking one of the windows. In one jerk, he grabbed one of the bandits with his feet and then pulled him over. The next moment, the robber's neck snapped. He started screaming frantically, and the guy ordered him to stop the vehicle immediately or his arm would be broken. Shin turned his gaze to the driver and saw a horrific picture. The driver's legs were chained to the seat, and he could not get it off the gas, so he immediately attacked the thieves to free the driver. The team communicated again with each other through telepathy. Shin said that the bus could not be stopped, but the man did not see this as a problem and decided to do it himself. Taking the torn road sign in his hands, he threw it against the windshield, and the vehicle gradually began to slow down. Taro held the sign tightly, doing his best to prevent trouble, and the people inside looked at the savior in surprise. Soon after, he burst into the bus wearing a face mask. The passengers were already looking at Sakamoto with fear, not knowing whether they could trust this strange man. Meanwhile, Shin sat down next to the unconscious robber, who mentally hoped that he hadn't fallen asleep, and Aoi happily approached her husband, saying that she knew Taro would definitely come. She also thought for a minute and said a little uncertainly that she hadn't mentioned another family rule in the morning. Sakamoto lifted the mask from his face, reminding him of their family's twelfth rule. It was their custom to heal after each battle with a delicious dinner, and he recalled what he had said to the girl at the beginning of their life together when she had almost held his hands for the first time. And soon everyone returned to the store where they served a lot of delicious food, 
and the thieves who broke into the bus were detained by the police. But as for the mysterious masked man who suddenly came to the aid of the victims, it was still a mystery, but it was suspected that this man was a martial arts master. Aoi's daughter said that the man looked exactly like her dad, and Shin asked how they managed to take this picture. Shin also said that the story of how he stopped killing was very moving to him, and when Taro looked at him stunned, the guy replied that he had been thinking about it all along, and that Shin knew everything because of his powers. But Sakamoto just told him that the boy was now part of their family, so he had to follow all the rules that the former mercenary had put in front of him. If he broke them, Sakamoto would kill him with his own hands. But Shin shouted that this was contrary to the very rules, because it was clearly stated that killing was forbidden. The next day, they were walking around the city with the whole family and wandered into an amusement park, and Shin decided to go to the shooting range, so he took aim with one eye closed. And then he fired but missed. It was not even close to hitting the target. But he sat down with the rifle on the grass, looking inside because he was sure that the sight was perfect and that the problem was probably with the weapon he had been given, and Shin wanted to take it apart and check it out. While the boy was doing this, Sakamoto won all the prizes that were offered here. The employee angrily told him not to come back here again because other children have nothing to win now, but Taro calmly walked to his with a bag of one toys. The next moment, a policewoman approached them, asking if their motorcycle was nearby. She started shouting that this was not a parking area and that it was forbidden to stop vehicles even for a few minutes. While the officer was talking to the man, Shin noticed an advertisement that mentioned Sakamoto, a mysterious masked man. The police girl was surprised to ask if they knew about the news because the whole city was talking about it, and the two men looked thoughtful, as if they were remembering something. The officer shouted that this was inexcusable because the so-called heroes were using violence. It was unacceptable, and she would have gladly arrested her right now if she knew these people by sight. They were a little scared, but tried not to let it show, and soon ran away from her as if to get another order. But the girl grabbed Shin by the shoulder, asking him how he knew that no one was hurt, because it was not published anywhere. The guy tried to make excuses, saying that he just really hoped no one was hurt. But again, he said something that was better left unsaid, and Sakamoto only thought about wishing the guy would shut his mouth. And soon they were lucky. The girl was distracted, and at that moment they successfully ran away from her headlong, but the officer was determined to catch them. No matter how fast the boys ran, the girl was extremely fast, and it was difficult to escape. People who were looking out of the windows at the time noticed that Sakamoto was running from the police, and this surprised them, because everyone knew him as perhaps the most wonderful person in the city. While they were running, they were stopped by vendors who offered Sakamoto a taste of their new product, but he just dropped a few moments into his cash register and ran on. After a while, Shin and Taro managed to get away, and the policewoman was puzzled that she had lost them. The guys disguised themselves well enough, and Sakamoto decided to take some food with him. However, this disguise was not enough for long, because they gave themselves away in a matter of minutes and had to run away from the girl again. Shin had no idea if the Taro had any plan, so he suggested that he could serve as a bait and that they might get somewhere. But Sakamoto didn't answer and ran on, taking a sign from a shop nearby. He threw it at the girl's feet, which she obviously did not expect, but now she was riding a small board on the asphalt. After a while, the girl just fell into a puddle, and the children immediately came up to her, asking if she was okay, but the policewoman quickly got up and flew after them. The boys hid in one of the street shops, and after a while they looked out to see if she had left, but were interrupted by the seller who told them that they had to pay for helping them, so they should buy ten skewers each, even though they were already full. Meanwhile, after walking a few more streets, the girl realized that she had lost sight of them. She hadn't lost any robbers for a long time, and now she was extremely upset by this outcome, but her colleague reassured the officer and asked if she was used to the job. To which the girl smiled and happily replied that she was very comfortable here, as her work was intense and interesting. She had incredible skills. She was the best recruiter and popular with the locals. And while she was talking to a colleague, Shin and Taro almost ran into her, but they quickly hid and kept quiet to avoid attracting attention. 
201 girl happily concluded her story and hoped that she could continue to help people who really need it now. Shin quietly said that now was the chance to run away for good, but for some reason the old man was not going to do it, even when the girl had already said goodbye to her friend and wished her a good evening. After that, the officer decided to go around the area again and be very careful to find the fugitives, but she was distracted by a local gang that was harassing the girl. A policewoman immediately came up to them, protecting the girl, and the bandit just laughed and told them to let him pass and not to run under their feet at all. But besides all this, a bag of white powder fell out of his pocket, which interested the girl. It seems she caught the drug addicts, although he missed the main target. And in Sakamoto's shop at that time, there was already a real family and relaxed atmosphere. Everyone sat down to eat the unsurpassed food that Taro loved so much. Today, no one left them alone for a long time, so they soon heard the door to the shop open and an officer enter. He apologized for interrupting the meal, but told them about the policewoman who had been chasing them all day and that she had not returned to the station today, and he had only one question. Did they know where she might be now? They thought about it for a while, and Taro's daughter replied that she liked this officer very much. She was very kind and brave. Once, when a little girl lost her mother, she carried her back to her mother on her back, and on the way, she treated her to ice cream, a whole portion of it. And because Nikasi was very good, the girl was a little worried about her. The policeman patted her on the head, and Shin asked what was the best thing to do in this situation. The man replied that he would have to do some poor chores. Meanwhile, the policewoman was sitting tied to a chair by this gang of drug addicts, Ricky, who was the leader of the motorcycle gang, Zutomo, claimed that he did it only because she caused them a lot of problems. But he didn't really want to do it. After that, he blindfolded her and started mocking her for not even owning a rifle. But she replied that even if she did, her girlfriend would never bring it on him, which surprised Ricky. He just started laughing at her with his whole gang. Shin and Sakamoto set out to find it. And soon they found something. Shin wanted many voices quietly of that factory behind the shopping street. Despite all this, the officer promised to protect the girls, although she did not know how to do so. But soon several smoke grenades flew at Zutomo's gang, and then a huge smoke rose around them all. Ricky screamed loudly and his eyes started to water. Each of the gang members started coughing extremely hard, trying to cover his mouth with his hand. And then they saw a strange figure in the smoke that really scared them and then they saw another unknown person. Shin would try to give Sakamoto certain coordinates so that he could go in the right direction. Taro listened attentively and soon got to Zutomo's Dolider, Riki Yi, and kicked him right in the face with all his might. Junior started transmitting several coordinates again, and the gang began to panic even more, realizing that someone had attacked them, while Sakamoto continued to deal with them. Taro must have done this, and then he took some boards and hit his enemies on the head with them, and they began to fall to the ground one by one. And soon enough, they were all lying on the ground together, completely powerless, and now they certainly could not get up. The young officer was very surprised when everything went quiet. At that moment, she did not understand what had happened. Riki was about to attack her out of anger because he believed that she was to blame for all of this. But Sakamoto did not allow him to do so and punched him right in the cheek. The blindfold that had been used to blindfold the girl fell off, and only now did Shin realize that he had not disguised himself at all, and the girl saw through it. Sakamoto was standing in front of her, but surprisingly he was extremely thin, and she asked him in surprise who he was. The junior assistant also looked at Taro in shock, wondering how he could lose weight so quickly. The two boys decided to run away from her as fast as possible, jumping over all the obstacles, and the girl realized that he looked exactly like the man she had recently chased. The next day, everyone was sitting quietly in the shop again, and Shin stood in front of Sakamoto with his mouth agape. Taro was back in his previous form of a fat man. He continued to eat a lot of food. The guy was very shocked that yesterday he looked completely different. Nakas, in turn, returned to the station and immediately began to train hard without wasting a single minute. She was angry with herself because yesterday she looked too helpless. But she couldn't get enough of this guy with glasses. Shin kept trying to tell him that he should eat at least a little less, because he was very fat again, and he looked much better when he was slim. After a while, they went out for a walk in Chinatown, not even taking off their aprons, 
and they walked with smiles to this huge area of the city. Shin was surprised to ask why he had to go so far, or just to replenish his stock, Taro replied that there was a certain limit for each customer, and soon he saw the divine pork buns that he loved so much and seemed to have come just for them. This would have been enough for both Aoi and Hana, so they were calmly walking back when they heard a large explosion nearby. A girl jumped out of nowhere and fell down next to Sakamoto, kicking up a mountain of dust, and the boy immediately asked if he was okay and if he had bruised himself. But Taro didn't care about himself at all. He was only concerned about the buns he had just bought and were now lying happily on the floor. He took them in his hands, upset, and the guy began to reassure him that he could shake them off the dust and everything would be fine. Meanwhile, the girl was on alert, realizing that there was nowhere to run. A gang of strange men were chasing her, and they were very serious about her. Lu Xiaotang stood calmly, confident in herself, knowing that they would never get her. The girl dashed to one of the gang members and elbowed him, and the man in the black jacket pulled a knife out of his pocket. However, the very next moment Sakamoto stood up for her, taking out a pair of tongs and breaking the knife with them. Sheen hit one of the men in a nearby box hard and sharply, which scared all the gang members, and now they were not so sure that they would catch the girl. But she was not going to stand aside either, and took to the air to approach her enemies. After that, she punched one of them in the stomach and he fell to the ground. Shin admired her, noting that she fought well, while Sakamoto, as always, thought only of his own, that is, of food. He seemed to care only about food, and Lu was as confident as ever, ready for battle. While the younger boy was wondering who the woman was, Taro continued to think about pork buns. The same men approached them, but with the whole gang, and they wanted to destroy them as soon as possible, considering them to be blue rivals. So they decided to run away. Taro took the girl on his shoulders and they ran away from the gang, trying to hide. Shin noticed that this had been happening to them too often lately, and all they did was eat and run away from some strange men, and Lu, meanwhile, looked at them in surprise, asking who they were. But the escapees really succeeded. The gang lost sight of them. So Vanya decided to try to find the process of strange men that helped her at least some information you know where to look for them. When they came to their mentor, he was extremely angry that this girl was allowed to escape again because they had already destroyed her entire family. Wang was very disappointed with his subordinates and, despite their excuses, ordered them to get out of his sight immediately. But before he could do anything, a man rushed at him and hit him in the face. He started laughing with his mouth closed and seemed to be about to finish him off right now, but he was still trying to breathe. His brother turned to him and told him that it was absolutely not cool and that he should stop doing that. He looked extremely funny at that moment. The clan leader turned to the boys in surprise, asking why he had killed him so quickly. Wang said that he needs the key that the girl has, and if he gets it, he will have power over the entire black market, and their main task is to find her. The two maniacal brothers said that they could dispose of anyone who got in their way, and the leader gave his approval. And while the so-called gang that Shin and Sakamoto had recently joined was running away from these strange men on the rooftops, they now learned that the girl was the daughter of the Triad family. The girl showed them the key that they were chasing her with. Her parents had left this key with her. Shin shouted for the girl to get rid of the key, and then it would all be over, because he believed that it was not worth dying and risking his life for. But Lou couldn't give it up because her mom and dad had kept this key at the cost of their lives, and if she didn't take care of it now, she wouldn't be able to meet them in the next world. Taro tried to ask her something else, but she sharply replied that it was none of his business. She apologized for causing them so much trouble, and Taro suggested that they go home. However, before that, the man asked Lou if she could make him pork buns, and she surprisingly replied that her father had taught her how to do it so she could do it but she was not sure about the taste. Shin looked at his friend with great surprise because they could get into trouble again if they went there. Sakamoto firmly said that purchases for the store were postponed and that they had to help this girl first. But when they're done with that, Lou has to make them these buns. This was the only condition that still surprised Lou. Shin turned his gaze to the man and then noticed a strange figure behind him, attacking Taro from behind. He barely touched him, but he wasn't going to back down. The gang caught up with them. 
While they were wasting time standing on the roof negotiating for buns, things were not looking good. The older brother told Bacho that he had absolutely no style, but he nervously replied that a killer shouldn't have any. They only needed to find their target and destroy it, and carefully decomposing the remains could always be left for later. But he meant something completely different. The problem was how he was going to destroy them. Shin asks Lu who these guys are, and she tells him that they are twin killers, Sung Hee and Bacho, who are hunting her down. For a small fee, she will kill anyone because they both appear to be serial killers who enjoy their work. Bacho was happy when he heard that they knew about them. He thought it was quite nice, but the older man said that mercenaries must remain anonymous, and he should be ashamed of himself. The younger Shin wasted no time in running up to Sung Hee, about to strike him. But he easily stopped his hand. The higher-up mocked him and said that his comrade was already lying dead. But the guys only laughed at this, because it was almost impossible to destroy Taro himself. Bacho, meanwhile, swung at the girl from behind when she was not expecting it at all, and it seemed that she had already given up, realizing that it could soon be over. But Sakamoto didn't rush at the guys very quickly and hit them hard, saying that sweet bean buns would be good for us as well. He did not stop and continued to fight with this killer. The girl looked at the man in surprise. The room underneath them began to fall apart. The calf broke apart, and everything on the tables and the cracked glass fell to the ground. They all landed successfully on the floor, but Sakamoto staggered a little on the spot. The two twins decided it was time to call it a day. They had to get their target, so they attacked. But before they did, they told her to hand over the key nicely, and they would end her less painfully, but she certainly wasn't going to do it. Her parents had once said the same thing just before they passed away, and before that they had suffered for quite a while. Did she really want to care more about a toy than her own life? It was very surprising to Seung Hee. Lu rushed forward and ordered him to shut up, but Shin stopped her, telling her not to fall for such pathetic provocations. But this safe contained her family's inheritance, and her father had died at the hands of these horrible people while protecting the safe. While the girl was unable to see, one of the twins fired a bullet at her, but Sakamoto saved her. The dream was telling me to stay away from the old man and not to interfere with his dealings with this girl. But he just said that it was not for him to decide what was important to her. This angered both twins, and now they decided to deal with this old man first and then move on to the girl. From both sides, they began to attack Taro with their katanas, but despite their good technique, the man still dodged every attack. He was completely fine despite a slight cramp in his neck, and the two assassins watched in amazement as this man dodged the blow, because no one could ever escape their attack tofu, and besides, this man was extremely large. Why the hell was this wake-up call completely unharmed? After that, they decided to use other techniques, and it was time for a special Maboryu technique. But again, the man deftly dodged both of them, taking out a pot and a frying pan to fight back. Sung Hee couldn't believe his eyes, and Taro began to laugh at them as he stood calmly with a frying pan in his hands. Shin ran up to him anxiously, asking how he was feeling, and he was fine, even though he hadn't carried anything heavy for a long time. The two brothers were completely pissed off by all this, and they just wasted no time, so they just had to take their main target and finish it off. But the boy took the rope and, hearing him clearly and distinctly through his own ability to read minds, stopped the man. After which Sun flipped several times in the air and fell on his teeth. And soon a cupboard full of different products arrived on top of it. They were already lying down completely exhausted, and after the frantic noise there was complete silence, the girl barely managed to squeeze out a question. She did not understand who she had just contacted. She laughed, saying that the men were very strange, but thanked them for saving her. Meanwhile, the leader of their clan was very angry. He had no idea what his mercenaries were doing because they already knew the location of the safe, and it was a simple matter of getting it. However, imagine his surprise when two strange men appeared from behind him, intent on dealing with him. Two extremely powerful assassins were lying on the floor tied up, which surprised the leader even more, and he asked what they had done to his bodyguards. Meanwhile, Lou snuck up on him from behind. She wanted nothing more than for this scoundrel to disappear from the world, despite his apologies. His place was in hell, not on this earth. And within a short period of time, the head of the clan was lying on the floor 
Shin was also not going to stand by and wanted to help deal with these people, but Taro stopped him by taking him by the neck and crunching it slightly, which offended him greatly. Lu calmly replied that if you destroyed everyone who hurt her, it would never end. Her father taught her that the best revenge is to live a happy life. After some time, the girl was opening the safe with the key, but at first she was not able to do it, and Shin started to tease her, to which she reacted quite aggressively. But soon she managed to open the safe and they entered it together, seeing all its beauty from the inside. There was a lot of gold, silver, a lot of treasures and jewelry, plus a lot of books and CDs and toys. There was really a lot of stuff. Shin sat down to read some book where there was a precise description of the room. There were certain items with numbers, and most likely these items are favorites depending on each head of the Lu family. Several centuries, that is. Other things, different people were friends with all these things. But the girl was only interested in the one her father was with. Soon they came across sake and there was a note on the bottle. The girl read what it said, that she had to drink sake from Xiao Tan when she came of age, that it was the most delicious thing on earth, and that she was going to take a glass to everyone as a sign of gratitude. While the girl was pouring the drink, Shin began to read the note himself. They were sitting in the middle of the room, savoring an unrivaled drink with freshly prepared Japanese pork buns. And the next day, Lu joined their shop and put on her apron. She had nowhere else to work, so Sakamoto offered to take her on. Shin was surprised that Ta was going to work at all, because she had a lot of treasure, but she couldn't just sell her family treasure. For some reason, the boy was too tense and picked on every little thing. The girl told him to calm down a bit, and Taro told them to shut their mouths because he had a bad headache. The next day, when Lu came to the store, she was greeted by Shin's disgruntled face, telling her she was late. She didn't understand why he changed his attitude to her so much, because she was just a little late but two hours was too much. He asked her if she had ever worked before, and she replied that of course she had. She used to help her father dig big holes and bury mysterious sacks in them. After these words, the guy started begging Taro to fire this girl. She didn't fit this calm atmosphere of the store. Although it was difficult to say this about the guy himself, given his character. But Sakamoto told him to calm down in a calm tone of voice because it was not nice, and Lou told him to apologize whenever he was late. While the two stood there with shocked faces, Sakamoto calmly read the newspaper, occasionally glancing at them, and then told them to get to work in the morning. Today, he was the most talkative he'd been in all the time Shin had known him. It was the first time he'd spoken so much, and usually even his thoughts were concise. But he was not just a piece of flesh talking. In Taro's opinion, such words were impolite. But it was just an innocent conversation. Sakamoto stood calmly at the counter. But the next moment, something extremely strange began to happen, and now there were two Mr. Sakamoto, which frightened Shin. One of them was reading a newspaper while sitting on a chair, and the other was just watching, after which one of them exclaimed joyfully that they were doubles. But the real Sakamoto was not happy about it and abruptly got up from his chair, coming closer to the man. He silently pulled out a pistol, standing very close to him, and then muttered something. The strange man was saying that Taro was still in good shape despite his figure, and Shin didn't understand who the hell this face-changing devil was, and he couldn't read his thoughts either. The black-haired guy started laughing a lot, looking at the surprised faces of the boy and the girl, and when asked by Shin, Taro said that he should be stuffed in a bag. However, the boy calmly gave his name, saying that he worked in the supermarket across the street and had been friends with Sakamoto for a long time. Shin remarked that he was very young, but Lu interrupted the conversation and replied that there was no supermarket across the street. Taro himself said that Nagumo was an old colleague of his back when he worked as a mercenary, and that he was actually not 18, as he said, but 27. When Nagumo was caught for this lie, he replied that Sakamoto's head was worth a good sum, as much as a billion yen. Lu was sure that he was lying again, just like the last time and Shin added that even a schoolboy could come up with a better lie than this guy. But he claimed that it was true, that yesterday at the Conference of Killers it was finally approved, and tomorrow all this will be included in the list. Among knowledgeable mercenaries, this information has already spread. But then they heard the voice of a man who brought them a pizza, and something was wrong with him. The next moment, Nakajima approached Nagumo with the knives, telling him not to move, or the boy's cute face would suffer at his hands. 
While Lou and Shin were thinking about what to do, Sakamoto was enjoying the delicious pizza that the courier had just brought. His friend was about to be sent to the next world, and the man was sitting there as if nothing was happening. However, while they were talking, Nagumo untied all the ropes and got behind the courier, and then took him by the neck to prevent him from escaping. Taro calmly told Nagumo not to do what he was thinking of doing, not to kill him. The guy immediately let Nakajima go, but asked why he still adhered to the no-kill policy. He doesn't think he can fight them that way, and you can't defeat other killers that way either. The three men who worked in the shop angrily approached Nagumo to which he awkwardly replied that he would not be involved anymore and smiled, saying that they specialized in preventing various murders, and as he was about to leave the shop, added that he missed the days when he and Taro worked as a team. When he opened the door, Sakamoto called out to the young man, who asked if anyone would benefit from his death now. It was a good question, but their job was to follow orders, not to question them. But for a retired man, he went too far when he destroyed the Danshokai Triad. Nagumo was pleased to see his old friend again, but it was time to leave. He wanted to say goodbye before he was eliminated, but he did not let Shin leave again. But despite the fact that Nagumo was still standing in the store a second ago, he was nowhere to be found in a moment. Shin looked around in surprise, looking for the guy, wondering if he could trust him, and the girl thought it would be better to return to her country. She didn't know where it would be safer, and Sakamoto looked at the empty pizza box. This pizza guy failed the plan, so we had to find a new pawn. Meanwhile, the gangs were negotiating how much everyone would pay for the old man's head. But one of them was now hungry, offering to take a pizza, and at the same time muttering that no one had underestimated Sakamoto. However, one of the gang wanted to outsmart him. They just need to figure out how and when to do it. They need to determine the time and place where he will be most vulnerable, which is how the Dondenkai clan should act. But Taro was a former member of the Order. If they made a mistake somewhere, they could be destroyed, every single one of them. Some thought it was just a legend, but in any case, everyone was sure that he was just a pensioner who had been retired for more than five years and shouldn't cause any problems. But imagine their surprise when Sakamoto appeared on the giant screen with a gun in his hand, ordering them to drop the case. They got up from their chairs in fright, realizing that they had been found, he noticed her hidden camera but the leader didn't care. He looked at him calmly and exhaled slowly. The next moment, the glass shattered from a gunshot and fell loudly to the ground. Shin thought about Nagumo's words. If it turned out to be true, they would soon see a lot more guys like that pizza delivery guy here, but Sakamoto was sure there was no point in worrying. Since they knew who her enemies were, it was better to stay home and be quiet lambs, Taro thought about it all the time, even when he was walking around the city with his family. Shin and Sakamoto overhear Aoi talking to her daughter, and they talked about what was going to happen tomorrow. They didn't know anything yet, but the girl said they had to meet Sugar. Aoi recalled that they had promised to take Kana to the amusement park tomorrow, and the child was looking forward to it. Sweat broke out on the boys' faces, and they realized that the plan was not going as they had originally intended, but since they had already promised, they had to take the child to the amusement park while Mom and Hana talked about what they should bring tomorrow. When the morning came, everyone ran to the amusement park, Tokyo Sweet Park, and enjoyed riding the various carousels. But Sakamoto got tired pretty quickly. He was asked if he was feeling well, and his daughter offered him some of her ice cream, hoping it would make him feel a little better. He replied that he started to feel sick, Everyone started to fuss. Aoi offered some cool water, and Lou and Hana looked at the map of the park. And the park's mascot was a cute hare holding several balloons in his paws. The mascot's name was Sugar. It was a very special day for the girl. They all had fun together like a big friendly family. She wanted to have incredible fun today. But how can you rejoice when Sakamoto is literally in the crosshairs, being hunted and a lot of money is being paid for his head? But there was no other way out. They were here and there was nothing to be done if not for these damned enemies. Today would have been a beautiful day off, and Lou was eating another stick she liked so much. But Shin immediately turned his gaze to her, reminding her that their main duty today was to protect Sakamoto, not to eat chopsticks, that their priorities were to eliminate enemies and keep the family happy, and that they should make sure Taro himself had a good day.
but the crowd was just crazy. It was hard to identify your enemies, but Shin reassured Lu, saying that there was no threat in the area at the moment. He explained that he could read the thoughts of all people within a 20-meter radius, and that any person planning a murder would have a heightened emotional state. The girl approached him, asking if he always reads her thoughts, to which he frowned and replied that he did not need to. He needs to tune in to read someone's thoughts. They don't just come all the time. And he was annoyed that the girl asked so many other questions. While Lu was taking offense somewhere nearby, Shin reported that he had sensed the enemy's location near them. Sakamoto looked around, trying not to draw too much attention to himself or act strangely. Their enemy was disguised as an ordinary janitor who covered his face and had already seen his victim. When they met so closely, the janitor remarked that the man had courage to go for a family walk at such a time. The man was ready to kill Sakamoto in front of his own child, but in the meantime, in order to avoid attracting the attention of outsiders, he simply stood on the street. Taro moved away from his family a little, having previously stretched his arms, and the enemy was about to attack the old man from behind. But he failed, and without even turning his head back, Sakamoto punched him in the face. While the girl and the others were looking at the amusement park, Taro had to deal with this bastard. The man realized that he would not be dealing with an ordinary pensioner who could barely move, and while Sakamoto returned to his family, Shin went to deal with this janitor. Lu also admired how skillfully the boss used his techniques, not even looking at the enemy but hitting the target. He also avoided injuries to his arteries and important organs, so he will live on in peace. This guy was really lucky, but now Kuri is lying somewhere among the trees. He was watched by another mercenary, who told him that the janitor's stuff was an outdated topic, and he really tried to tell him that, but it didn't work. And this guy, Sakamoto, he wished he could finish what he had started, or if that fat guy was really a former legend. And Shin could be another problem on his way. He can read minds, so you need to clean them up and not pay attention to anything to sneak up on the target. So the man threw away the piece of paper he was holding and began to approach Shin. Sakamoto and his family had already moved far away from him. Lu only said that this is how children lose their parents in a crowd, and meanwhile the strange man crept closer and closer. The happy family boarded another train, and they were asked to hold on tightly throughout the trip. Hana was happy. She really enjoyed riding the various rides. Lu and Shin sat down behind him watching Sakamoto. Despite the fact that the trip was supposed to be interesting, Taro was having a hard time breathing because of the excitement, and the girl was also starting to worry. She was very worried about the guy sitting next to them, but Shin said that he didn't hear any thoughts from him. But the man was already starting to worry about being looked at like that. He turned slightly back to make sure he was accurately spotted, and that was the biggest mistake. Shin recognized him. The guy started to freak out. He tried to get rid of the railing because he realized that's where their target was. But it was too late. The train had already moved forward at breakneck speed, and all they could do was wait for it to stop. Shin apologized to Sakamoto that the enemy had slipped through him unnoticed, and that he should be extremely careful. He described the man's appearance in general, after which Taro turned to him. The man with silver hair noticed that he had armored glasses. He was a rather problematic customer. Meanwhile, Shin kept trying to get off this train as quickly as possible, even though it sounded crazy. Despite the frantic pace, the guy managed to get out and asked Lu to hold him. After that, Shin jumped down from the train, sliding down the track. The silver-haired man looked at him in surprise, marveling at his courage, and then Shin jumped right on his back. It only took him a minute to throw the man down from his own seat. They rolled down the track, but Shin managed to land safely when he caught his hand on the rails. The man straightened his hair, calling Shin crazy, and the latter just smiled in response. He would never ruin Mr. Sakamoto's day off, and Shin himself could vouch for that. He was willing to work overtime to protect him. The man with bags under his eyes opened his mouth in surprise, taking it as a threat. Shin defended him at the cost of his own life, because he was supposed to rest today. However, there was a problem. No matter how hard he tried, he could not read his mind. This man was the kind of person who acts without thinking. Shin realized that he could not dodge his daggers. The man was too fast. It was a real mess. The guy fell face first onto the flights, thinking what to do next. Meanwhile, the blonde threw his trademark poison at the guy, so that now he couldn't even open his eyes and could have died after that. 
However, Shin was not going to give up, and despite the pain, opened his eyes, after which the blonde realized that he was no ordinary opponent. But his eyes said that he was afraid to die, just like Sakamoto. When a person is not ready to face death, others can see this fear in their eyes. The more a person clings to life, the weaker they become and the fear of death reduces their ability to make decisions. It was the same with him. Shin was afraid of the daggers, which is what allowed him to be wounded, but he was already completely insane. However, Mr. Sakamoto was not afraid of death at all, even though the enemy was sure of it. Shin performed a very important mission, protecting his hero's family at the cost of his own life. However, a person who has something to defend will fight to the last. It seemed that he had completely lost his mind and stopped seeing. His desperate words sounded pathetic. But it didn't matter to him whether he could see, because in any case, there was only one way out. Now it got even more fun, and Shin jumped into the trolley, driving straight for the enemy. When it drove closer, Shin pushed off the seat and jumped right at the enemy, grabbing him by the back. Each time, Shin became more interested. His smile became crazy, and he just waited for the next step. There had to be a way to get the better of him and come out on top, and the guy was thinking about how he could do it. In his head, he heard a lot of different voices from all the people around him, but not a single thought from the blonde man. Shin punched him in the stomach with all his might, and they both flew off the track to the side. They both went down. Meanwhile, Sakamoto and his family, as well as many other people, were at the performance for children who watched the actors enthusiastically. And what a great surprise and panic there was when two men fell from the sky onto the stage, kicking up a lot of dust. The animators looked in surprise at the blonde man, who for a while did not understand anything as he lay on the stage, but then immediately ordered him to shut his mouth. A giant hare came on stage smiling. However, this costume disguised Shin, and the enemy took out several more of his daggers preparing for battle. The next moment, Shin showed what a real sugar bunny punch is and rushed towards the enemy. It flew into his face and the squirrel began to applaud and support his favorite. Although the blonde tried to hit the hare, the latter skillfully dodged his blows every time. He came closer and hit harder each time, which confused the enemy. He didn't understand how it was possible to move so fast when a person can't see anything. And the audience was still applauding and looking enthusiastically at the characters in the play, and Aoi also noted that it all looked very realistic. Sakamoto didn't say anything to his daughter or his wife, and they thought he was very interested, but in fact, Taro was telling Shin how and where to move. The guy attacked with all his might, and the blonde thought that the poison had just worn off too quickly. Shin also read his every move, and in general, his own movements were like those of a completely different person. Suddenly, he started attacking even more actively, and the latter pulled out a dagger. Much to our surprise, the guy's eyes were closed when the enemy cut the suit. Sakamoto now finally realized that the end had come. After the fatal blow, he will definitely pass out. The man with the round eyes fell to the ground, not realizing what had just happened, and the audience rose to their feet and applauded Tsukrik while standing. While Shin was winning the battle, Lu was still riding the train with a scared face. When everything had calmed down, Lu decided to help Shin with his eyes, which were still stinging. She wanted to give him eye drops, but he was twitching and wouldn't let her. When she finally succeeded, Shin cried out loud, saying that it was very painful, but the procedure had to be repeated for the other eye. The tied-up blonde man was sitting in the corner, and it was a good thing he had the antidote with him, but this was standard practice for him. Sakamoto asked who hired him. But first he asked if he would let him go if he confessed. Lou walked up to the blonde man and took his poison knife, then cut him lightly and he screamed. And in turn, the girl began to pour the antidote on the ground so it was better to speak now before it ran out. Nevertheless, the man replied that he had been hired by the Dondankai Company, a shadowy organization specializing in one-man operations for risky jobs. It didn't take much talking to get him to tell me everything, but he really wanted to live. It was like a regular concert, because there was no special loyalty from the company. He was a YAV mercenary, and the girl asked what the abbreviation was, to which the guy replied briefly. 481, it stood for Japanese Assassins Association, and Sakamoto and Shin also used to work there, and there were only professionals there, less than 400 of whom are in Japan. This document looked like a driver's license, according to Lou, but it was much harder to get. 
Meanwhile, the blonde mercenary asked Sakamoto for something. He was curious to know whether he was really a former member of the order or just a legend. But before he could say anything, his wife and daughter came up to them. They had been looking for them for a long time. The girls were hungry and offered to have a snack, and everyone gladly agreed. Shin lingered for a while, then ordered the blonde not to contact them anymore, and he took all his weapons and calmly walked away. They came to this park just to have fun and had no other plans, but the man in black ruined everything. At the last moment, a little girl ran up to their enemy and then put a heart plaster on his scratch. She stroked his hand and said that he had performed very well on the show today. The blonde looked at her in surprise and pulled out a knife, then cut the ropes and freed himself. He decided that he would take one more roller coaster ride and go home. While the whole family was having a delicious dinner, Shin was very tired after everything that had happened. And also after the antidote, I felt dizzy and my thoughts were much harder to read. It was dangerous in Lou's opinion, so she suggested that Sakamoto go home, and Shin apologized for letting him down. AoE walked over to the table, looking at them all. They all behaved very strangely today, and the girl thought they were hiding something from her. Taro was worried while several people were having fun not far away. They decided to go all out tonight and throw a party. The girl looked at the man smilingly, telling him to behave normally and not to act like someone he didn't know. The guy shouted loudly, telling the girl to watch where she was going because she might step on ants. The only life they had to take was the life of their victim. The girl looked at him silently, and then he asked her if she wanted to rest, because her heels might get in the way, which she thought sounded cute. A blonde man who had recently escaped from the trap was washing his hands. The two men went in the same place, talking to each other. He turned around, but Obagura grabbed him by the neck. After that, she sat on his neck, smilingly looking into his eyes and asking him where he was going so quickly. He recognized a familiar face and began to tease her, but the man with the beard told him to stop talking idly. He also told her not to sit with her legs apart. The blonde asked Boyd and Obagura what they wanted from him. He began to answer him in his rude style, then added that he felt like a chaperone on a children's excursion with him because he could not finish anything himself. If they hadn't shown up, he would have been literally fired, so he had to be grateful for their appearance. And the girl was looking forward to meeting Taro Sakamoto himself, as she had never seen him before. A few days ago, Boyle received a gram that hurt him, and they started joking about something, and the blonde man said that these jokes were rather stupid and frivolous. However, two years ago, this couple put 200 people in the grave. They are the super-powerful duo Don and Kai. Meanwhile, the story went back to Sakamoto and his family, who claimed that they were not hiding anything. Aoi wondered if maybe he hadn't had a good lunch and was acting strangely. But Shin replied with a strange smile that they were all feeling fine and doing well. At such moments, it was harder to escape. When they were in the open, there was more of a threat. AoE and Hana have already decided where they want to go next for fun. Mom pointed to the haunted house. There were the best conditions for the enemy to attack. It was too dangerous. But still, they entered the Hospital of Terror, where the souls of patients who had been chopped to pieces by a local doctor wandered. Lou was very afraid of this and did not feel comfortable here, but she went inside anyway. Everyone started looking around, and Lou was handed a sedative. Shin shone the flashlight forward and the same doctor appeared behind the company. Obagura and Boyd were watching them through the camera. It was time for a house of horrors. A mannequin with glassy eyes stood behind Shin, but he dodged the blow by bending forward. Ioe and Hana reacted calmly to this, but Sakamoto, Lu, and Shin knew that it could have been a real danger. Meanwhile, the mannequin stopped next to Taro and Ioe. While the family was laughing, Shin noticed the rookie mercenary's card. If they send the best people here, there is nothing to worry about. Obagura noticed that the big guy moved well for his age and weight. But Boyd didn't want to mess with it for a long time, preferably to deal with it quickly and complete the task. The girl reassured him that he would be able to deal with the victim himself, as they were special friends. He just opened the bottle, broke the top, and drank what was inside. But he was not his friend. Back in Sakamoto's youth, they had been together at the environmental school in Vwifts. Tara was only 14 at the time, and Boyd was 15. He had heard that Sakamoto was extremely strong and was curious about the guy. This alarmed Taro, but he assured him that he was not here for revenge. After that, they became friends, 
had a lot in common, and often spent time together outside of school. Then, in one of the lessons, Boyd read that today is Valentine's Day, which was not good for them, because they were bad and did not expect attention and love. However, Sakamoto was approached by more than one girl who handed him a gift, embarrassed at the same time. And Nagumo brought a whole bunch of sweets that were given to him. They exchanged a few words. Taro suggested to his friend that he could get a chocolate bar in one place and pointed somewhere. Boyd stood in the middle of the room watching the line until an older man approached him. He thought that they were like-minded and would be friends for a long time, but he was not cruel in the end. After that, they broke off ties and this battle was supposed to be about revenge and remembering the past. At least that's what Obagura thought, but Boyd exclaimed that this was absolutely not the case and he held no grudge. Meanwhile, more and more zombies appeared in the House of Horrors, and Shin had no idea how many mercenaries could be hiding there. Lu asked if they could finally go home. But Hanaya liked it here. She was curious how it would end. This daughter of Mr. Sakamoto was not as cowardly as Lu and Shin ridiculed her for it. But the girl just snorted and drank more sedatives, which in fact turned out to be a discharge. While they were standing by the closed and taped door, they heard strange knocks coming from there. Lou smiled. She was having a lot of fun after that liquid. She calmly walked closer to that door, and a bunch of zombies fell out on her, reaching out to the girl with their hands. Everyone but Lou was very scared, and she was standing next to them laughing. It seemed like a sea of zombies because they kept coming and kept coming. Sakamoto was determined to go fight them, but they soon found themselves in a crowd of monsters. And while they were fighting, Obagura and Boyd came in, and he told her to clear the area, but the girl didn't like that he was always ordering her around. In a matter of seconds, mercenary cards flew in the man's face to distract him. He calmly turned his gaze back and asked his old friend if he remembered him. Taro said he didn't know him and asked where his family was. Obigura, meanwhile, was with everyone else. Shin got to his feet looking at the girl. And Lou didn't care who was standing in front of her. She was very happy and joyful, so she flew to the girl with a smile. She was going to deal with her old friend on her own. And Boyd and Sakamoto were on alert. He wanted to make Taro remember him, and he would pay for everything he had done.